<laughs> Rejoicing in the Lord together. Would you stand with me, please? Would you stand with me? Uh, I love those conversations. They're glorious. Keep them going afterwards. Um, let's, uh, but let's, uh, let's zone in here to help us do that. Our, open, our, our uh, opening scripture sentences are from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. And so hear what the Lord says to his people. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Let's sing together. This is the gospel of Christ. To destroy the works of the evil one, Because the gospel is true, hear, uh, hear this call to confession of sin from Isaiah 55 uh, with encouragement. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So while you remain standing or while you sit or while you kneel, uh, whatever posture helps you come before the Lord with a humble heart, I invite you to agree with him about your sin, to admit it, to turn from it, to return to him, unfeignedly believing his holy gospel. And then in a few minutes, we'll pray the prayer on the screens together.
and now uh, corporately as his people, let's confess together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now stand with me and uh, just hear this prayer for pardon. Just let it wash over us. Uh, this we can pray because the gospel is true. Almighty God, you have promised forgiveness to all who turn to you in repentance and faith. Pardon us and set us free from all our sins. Strengthen us to do your will and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's carry on together with question 14 of the New City Catechism. Here's the question. Did God create us unable to keep his law? Here's the answer. No. But because of the disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all of creation has fallen. We are all born in sin and guilt, corrupt in our nature and unable to keep God's law. Uh, here, here's where it comes from. Romans 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. So let's say it together. Let me ask you the question. Did God create us unable to keep his law? No, but because of the disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, all of creation is fallen. We are all born in sin and guilt, corrupt in our nature, and unable to keep God's law. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why we're desperate for a savior. That's why we need the greater and better Adam. And so let's sing, show us Christ.
Lord. You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Please be seated for our Bible readings. It's a long Bible reading today, so have your Bibles open. Have your noses in your Bibles. Uh, follow along closely, please. Our sermon reading for today begins in the 12th chapter of the book of Acts, verse 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. Continuing through the chapter 14, verse 28. Here we go. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod, and the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the works to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of a devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see for the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who hear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, 
I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astonished and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogues broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of Christ. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, <clears throat> that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to enter eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of the high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly of the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. 
but the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand up! <clears throat> Stand upright on your feet! And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. But when the apostle, apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, men, why do you do these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. The Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. <clears throat> Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and they remained no little time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, be to God. Thanks, Susan and Mark, for reading the Bible to us. Please do uh, keep your Bibles open. It's a long passage. We've read all the way through it. I don't have time to read all the way through it again, so I need you to keep your eyes in it. Uh, I'll point you in certain directions as we go through. And uh, let me pray and ask God to help us understand his word as we study it together. Uh, our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks that you've gathered us together under your word again today. Uh, Lord, we're so, so, so thankful for the Bible. We give you praise and thanks uh, that you are getting the gospel out to the globe. And uh, Lord, we uh, pray that you would um, help us to understand your word as we study it now and to see with confidence that the gospel advances even through opposition, the gospel advances and you're building your church uh, and you're well able uh, to keep it. And so, uh, so Lord, we pray that you would give us confidence in you as we study your word together now in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we come to a major turning point in the book of Acts this morning. 
in fulfillment of what the risen and reigning Lord Jesus has said in chapter 1, verse 8. Remember, you will be my witnesses. Uh, right? You will receive power and the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So now in fulfillment of what the risen and reigning Lord Jesus had said there in 1.8, uh, that the good news about him would go out to the globe. Uh, the good news about him has been proclaimed in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and now it is going out to the ends of the earth. Um, Paul moves into, into center stage rather than Peter here. Mission is the central theme, and the gospel is going to the Gentiles. Uh, that's the transition point, the turning point in the book, if you like. Luke continues to show us that the Lord Jesus is sovereign over the gospel, that he is getting the gospel out to the globe. And as he records this first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas, he wants us to see a number of things. Luke wants us to see that the gospel divides. The gospel divides between those who believe it and those who don't. In the face of that, he wants us to see that the gospel advances no matter what. The gospel advances no matter what. And he wants us to see that the gospel creates local churches, believing people as it is proclaimed. Luke wants us to have confidence in the gospel to do its work. The great news of this passage is that the gospel does do its work as it's faithfully proclaimed by the grace of God. So today we get to see how the gospel progresses through opposition. And we get to see what the gospel produces as it goes out to the globe. So we're going to look at the passage under three headings. First of all, the gospel divides. The gospel divides. Now that's a stark heading. So as we jump into this first section from 1225 to 1312, uh, it's very important for us to realize that the gospel both unites and divides. The gospel unites those who believe it. Right? We're one in Christ as those who believe the gospel, united in him, united in the gospel. So the gospel unites those who believe it, but the gospel also brings division between those who believe it and those who don't believe it. That's why the proclamation of the gospel is becoming increasingly socially unacceptable in our culture. Because proclaiming the Christian message brings division. But the gospel message is the message that everybody on the planet needs to hear. And so when Barnabas and Saul had finished taking relief to the believers in Jerusalem and had returned to the church at Antioch, while the church was worshiping together, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Just look again at chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. Uh, or actually two, three, and four, while they were worshiping, I think because when Paul and Barnabas come back, they gather the church together to report what God has done, it's fair for us to say that the they here is the whole church, the leaders along with the church. So while they, the church, were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. Paul and Barnabas were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit and by the church at the same time. Do you see that in those verses? The Holy Spirit gave clear instructions to set apart Paul and Barnabas. And he sent them out. And the church got to participate in it by fasting and praying and laying hands on them and sending them off. And here's the key point. This multicultural and multi-ethnic church, as reflected by its leadership, gives of its best. They're told by the Holy Spirit to set these guys aside and send them off 
and they do it. The Holy Spirit sends them out, sets them apart and sends them out. The church sets them apart and sends them out. And the church is happy to give of their best. When called by God to send out Paul and Barnabas, they're happy to send two of their most eminent and gifted leaders. And they're happy to give 40% of their church leadership all for the sake of the gospel. They're very willing to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel because they are passionate about God's agenda. God's agenda of getting the gospel out to the globe. They are passionate about preaching the gospel. They are passionate that the gospel would go to the ends of the earth. And so they're happy to send Paul and Barnabas out. And Paul and Barnabas set sail. And when they come to Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God. But right away, we see the division. Pick up at verse, uh, verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God, God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and, and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Sergius Paulus sought to hear the word of God, but Bar-Jesus sought to turn him away from the faith. The division starts right away. Uh, as they arrive and are proclaiming the word of God. And this mixed response to the gospel is something that we see all the way through this missionary journey. So, uh, so just look with me at chapter 13, verse 42. As they went out, the people begged that these things be told them the next, on the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So evidently a bunch believed. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore, bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders done by their hands. But the people of the city were what? Divided. Some sided with Jews and some with the apostles. And look across the page, chapter 14, verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derby. So all the way through, we get this mixed response. There are people who want to hear more about the gospel. There are people who believe the gospel and are encouraged to keep on going. And there are people who oppose the gospel. Those are the responses you get all the way through this missionary journey, actually all the way through the rest of Acts. Those responses. We want to hear more. Those who believe the gospel, those who oppose the gospel. And uh, Bar Jesus actually betrays his name. His name means son of salvation. But Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, confronts him and tells him that he's actually a son of the devil. Just look again at chapter 13, verse 9. 13, 9. Bar Jesus, Elymas, the magician. Magician is his name. He's a contradiction in terms. He's a Jewish magician. That ought not to be so. <laughs> Jews were clearly forbidden from magic. So he's a, he's, a, he's a contradiction in terms. Uh, Elymas the magician seeks to oppose 
them and to turn the pro cancel from the faith, verse nine, but Saul, who was also called Paul, so now I can just keep on calling him Paul, praise the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all unrighteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Uh, so Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, actually confronts Bar-Jesus or Elymas. Um, we could read those verses and think to ourselves, wow, Paul, you could have been a little bit more pastoral there. But Luke tells us he was filled with the Spirit, which means what, what Paul's doing in this moment is what God wants him to do. And God has, has Paul confront Elymas clearly. You're not a son of salvation. You're a son of the devil. And the contrast here is that Elymas is blinded for a time because he opposed the gospel. Blinded for a time, perhaps as a symbolic judgment to show how in darkness he actually is because he's opposed the gospel. And Sergius Paulus comes to believe because he's astonished at the teaching of the gospel. He sees the power of the Lord in these signs and wonders right, which is just affirming the truth of the gospel, and he's astonished by the truth of the gospel. He believes because he's astonished at the teaching of the gospel, and that pattern emerges, and it keeps on getting repeated all the way through this missionary journey, and it shows us that the gospel divides. The gospel divides, so uh, what do we do in the face of it? We trust the Lord, and that's our second heading, because the gospel advances. The gospel advances. The gospel triumphs over this Jewish magician, this contradiction in terms, and it continues to advance. So Paul and Barnabas go to Pisidian Antioch. That's a different Antioch the, where, the, where the church had sent them off and the Spirit had sent them off from. Now they're in Pisidian Antioch and are given an open door for the gospel in the synagogue there. Look at 13, verse 15. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have a word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. That's a beautiful open door for the gospel, isn't it? The Bible's just been read. Brothers, would you like to tell us what it means? Yes, I do, in fact. It's all about Jesus. And that's what Paul does. So Luke gives us a long outline of the apostolic presentation of the gospel. Luke's been doing this through Acts, right? He's been giving us these presentations of the, of the apostolic deposit the apostles proclaiming the gospel. He's done it with Peter in chapter two. Remember, he's done it with Peter in chapter 10. Now he does it with Paul here in 13. He's giving us a clear presentation of the apostolic gospel. It is a full summary of one of Paul's sermons, the longest that we have actually. Now we don't have time this morning to unpack it in detail. So please do take time to do that later on. But what we can do is to take note of the mountaintops of the gospel, so to speak. As we saw with Peter in chapter 10, so now we see with Paul. The outline of the gospel from the apostles is the life, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the response that must be made to him. It's the life, death, resurrection of the Lord Jesus and the response that must be made to him. That's what you see uh, in these outlines of, of the gospel presentation. Uh, the perfect and holy and amazing life of the Lord Jesus, the atoning, sacrificial, substitutionary death 
of the Lord Jesus, the glorious, powerful resurrection of the Lord Jesus, proving who he is and what he's done, and the response that has to be made to him. And that's what Paul does here. The way that Paul does that in the synagogue with an essentially Jewish or God-fearing audience is that he begins with the Old Testament shadows of salvation. So in verses 17 to 25, Paul goes through the Old Testament shadows of salvation. These are the shadows. Jesus is the substance. And Paul's emphasis here is on God's initiative of grace. So if you just glance down at those verses, God chose and God led and God put up with and God gave, right? It's all the initiative and the grace and the work of God. And what did God give? God gave the land. God gave the judges. God gave the monarchy. And from this history, God has brought a savior, Paul says, the Lord Jesus, just as he promised. So God is the subject of all of this. He took the initiative. He did it all. God has always been in control, always been at work, always been the one who graciously acts on behalf of his people. Paul, in the synagogue, after, after the reading uh, from, from the Pentateuch and the prophets, uh, can start there. And show that God has taken the initiative. And Jesus has always been the plan. So Paul moves on to the life and death of the Lord Jesus in verses 26 to 29. And the point here is that the life and the death of the Lord Jesus were the fulfillment of his promises. What the prophets said, the prophets that are read every Sabbath in the synagogue, what they said has been fulfilled. John prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life in accordance with the scriptures. He died as the substitute, becoming a curse for his people. The curse motif runs right the way through the Bible. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So just as the scripture says, he died as the substitutionary atoning sacrifice for his people. And that leads Paul to his third point, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And the fact that this was promised as well. So this is, verse, this is chapter 13, verses 30 to 37. God has fulfilled what he promised. The resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament was looking forward to. And so he quotes a couple of Psalms and he quotes Isaiah. So Psalm 2, he is the promised son. Jesus is the promised son with whom the father is well pleased. Isaiah 55, Jesus is the ruler of a good kingdom that will last forever and ever and ever. And Psalm 16, Jesus is the anointed one who could not see corruption because he's the forever king. The eternal son of God who reigns forever. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are the fulfillment of all of God's promises. That's Paul's point here. God's always taken the initiative to act in grace toward his people. He's done all of this and he's given you Jesus. He promised him. He promised his life, death, and resurrection. He promised it all and Jesus has fulfilled it all. The life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus are the fulfillment of all of God's promises. The promises of a glorious king ruling over a brilliant kingdom forever and ever and ever. And now Paul can conclude the sermon, his, not mine. He can conclude his sermon with the implications and the responses in verses 38 to 40. Uh, The responses are stark, and they actually come positively and negatively. So positively, there is forgiveness and justification for all who believe. This is what the Old Testament looked forward to, and this is what Jesus fulfilled. 
the forgiveness of sins, no longer having sins stand against us, having them wiped away, having them canceled. But not just having the debt side of our, sl of our slate wiped clean, also justification. Uh, just look at verse. Uh, just look at verse thirty-eight with me. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophet should come about. Look, you scoffers, be ashamed and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Uh, it's the forgiveness of sins on the one side, having all of our debt canceled, but it's not just having our debt canceled. Uh, it's also justification so that in the credit column goes the declaration that we are right with God because of the righteousness of the perfect life of the Lord Jesus given to us. His righteousness imputed to us. His perfect record credited to our account. Forgiveness of sins, the slate is wiped clean. We're totally forgiven. Justification declared right with God, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus given to us. It's absolutely brilliant. And Paul says, this is something that is impossible by the law of Moses. Look at verse 39 again. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. You could never get right with God by being good enough. And therefore, Paul gives a necessary warning in these verses as well. The negative. And Paul quotes Habakkuk in Psalm 41 in order to give the negative side of this, the warning. You must beware of the consequences of rejecting the good news of what God says. If you don't listen to him, then the unimaginable will happen. For the people of Habakkuk's day, that would be God raising up the Babylonians to execute judgment on them. And Paul is saying, make sure that doesn't happen to you. If you fail to respond to the good news about Jesus with faith and trust in him, then you will face the awful judgment and the terrifying wrath of God. It's a stark and stern warning. But it serves to highlight the good news of the gospel for us. Only Jesus can forgive us and justify us. And only Jesus can rescue us from the judgment and the wrath of God. So the call is to trust in him. All who believe in him will be forgiven and justified. Well, as we saw earlier, the reactions are mixed. Some want to hear more. Some believe and some oppose. But the gospel continues to advance. So just look at chapter 13, verse 46 with me. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up, by, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district, but they shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. 
uh, the gospel the gospel continues to advance. Uh, the gospel, when rejected, goes on to others. Nothing can stop the advance of the gospel. Those who reject it are judged. That's probably the knocking the dust off, right? That's the sign of judgment against them. They refuse the Lord. So those who reject the gospel are judged, and those who receive the gospel are joyful. And the gospel goes to the ends of the earth which is the quote in verse 47, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, originally, that's about the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the light for the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus is the one who brings salvation to the ends of the earth. Luke, uh, quoting, well, Paul quoting it here, and Luke showing it to us, is a way of him saying as Paul and Barnabas continue to take the good news about Jesus to the ends of the world, they're taking Jesus to the ends of the world. Jesus is getting the good news about him out to the ends of the earth. The gospel advances. Now they continue the pattern of first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles, right? As they go to Iconium, and the Lord used their preaching to bring many to believe. They go into the synagogue again first. Look at 14.1. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But that's not the only response, is it? Look at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers, uh, those who won't surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus, those who persist in unbelief here have their unbelief lead to opposition. And what do Paul and Barnabas in the face of opposition do? They speak on. Look at 14.3. So they remained for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And, uh, and, and when the opposition turns into an attempt to kill them, what do they do? Well, they move on, but they keep on speaking. Look at verse six. They learned of the plot. They fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia and the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Even in the face of sustained opposition, the opposition actually begins to follow them to the next towns. They continue to speak the gospel. Look at verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. So three, seven, 21, what are they doing in the face of sustained opposition? They're speaking on, they're speaking on, they're speaking on. They continue to speak the gospel. When we are opposed, we keep speaking the gospel. The gospel always advances. And Paul now is actually able to preach the gospel to total pagans in chapter 14, verses 8 through 18. You see, he will not keep silent. He just continues to preach. He continues to preach the word of God, the message of salvation, the message of his grace, the good news, the gospel. It gets talked about in all of those ways. They're just synonyms for each other. It's all the same thing. He keeps on proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus. Now, the Lord, in his kindness, heals this crippled man who'd been listening to Paul preach. But miracles don't necessarily lead people in the right direction. And so the people of Lystra go the wrong way with this miracle. And they actually want to worship Paul and Barnabas. Right? They, they actually want to offer sacrifices to them. You see, this miracle, like every miracle, needs to have the gospel as well. For sure, God is doing these signs and wonders that attest 
to the gospel. We've seen that all the way through Luke and Acts. But in order to be understood, the gospel has to be proclaimed. This miracle, as long with, uh, along with all of them, needs the gospel uh, as well. And so Paul tells them that he has good news for them. Look at, look at chapter 14, verse 15. Man, why are you doing these things? Are you trying to sacrifice them? We also are men of like nature with you. Interestingly enough, Paul does the exact opposite of what Herod did when everyone wanted to say that he was a God, remember? Uh, we're men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. Uh, so what does Paul say to these total pagans? I have good news for you. I have good news for you. The substance of Paul's message here is exactly the same, but his approach is different. He is in a totally pagan environment and speaking the gospel in new territory. And we're actually going to see more of this in Athens in Acts 17. Uh, and so he gives them the same gospel, but he does it from a different text, so to speak. With the Jews in the synagogue, he can do it from the text of Old Testament scripture, right? With the pagans, he, he, so, so with, the, with the Jews in the synagogue, he can do it from sp specific or special revelation. Uh, with these total pagans, you don't have reference uh, to that. He'll do it with general revelation. It's the same gospel, different text. And Paul turns on them, uh, and Paul t calls on them to turn from their idols and to trust in the living Lord Jesus, right? So, so to the Jews in Pisidian Antioch, he goes to the Old Testament and tells them that the gospel is about fulfillment. Jesus has done everything that he promised. To the pagans in Lystra, he focuses on general revelation, the world around them, and tells them the gospel is about replacement. Don't worship the creation, these vain idols, but worship the creator, the true and living God. Turn from these vain things to the true and living Lord Jesus. It's the same good news to both with totally different starting points. So with completely different starting points, Paul proclaims the same good news to G uh, about Jesus to both. And the response called for is the same. Repentance. Turn back to the Lord Jesus for rescue. Turn back to the Lord Jesus, to rule your life. Sin means the, re the rejection of the creator God for lesser things. And repentance means turning back to him and trusting in him. See, if, if we only preach sin as bad behavior, uh, then, then repentance will only be um, do better behavior. But Paul preaches repentance as you're living in God's world without reference to him. Repentance means turning back to him. Paul's preaching the same gospel, the same good news about Jesus, just in different settings, in different contexts. It's, a wonderful, it's just a wonderful word to us on, on um, knowing our audience, right? It, it, does, it does make sense for us to know who we're talking to. Uh, and to be able to give them the same gospel, the same good news about the same risen and reigning Lord Jesus, uh, just beginning from where they're at. And that's what Paul does here. Well, as we proclaim the good news, there will be different reactions, uh, but the gospel always 
advances, and that leads to our third and final heading very, very briefly, the gospel creates. Uh, Paul and Barnabas has, have been proclaiming the gospel, and uh, Romans 10, faith comes by hearing, uh, hearing by the word of truth. So many have believed, and, uh, and, and Paul leaves churches behind him. Uh, I, I, this is significant. Um, Paul does not leave uh, missionary agencies or denominational structures behind him. He leaves local churches. Um, and it's a great reminder to us that the gospel creates the church. The church did not create the gospel. And the church has ongoing gospel needs as we worship the Lord and get the good news about him out to the world. So, so Paul and Barnabas go back to Antioch. They go back the really, really, really long way. Um, uh, the, they actually retrace their steps. Uh, they go back through all of this hostile territory, right? Paul's been stoned and left for dead. What does he do? Oh, I'll go back there. That's awesome, right? He could get to Antioch really quickly, but what does he do? No, 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 let's go this way, right? He, he takes the really dangerous, really long way back to Antioch. Why? In order to strengthen the believers. Look at 1521. Uh, when they had preached the gospel to that city, they made many and made many disciples. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to, and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believe. That's why they go back this dangerous and long way, to strengthen the believers. And uh, three things stick out. They strengthen and encourage the believers, right? They establish and fortify these new believers and new local churches in the grace of God. So they encourage them to remain true to the faith. It's definite article, the, the faith, once delivered, uh, which they've received from him. Right? It, it gets talked about in different ways in the New Testament. The faith, the tradition, the deposit, the teachings, the truth. Stick with Jesus is what they go back and encourage them to do. Keep to the teaching of the Bible. Remain true to the faith. They have to strengthen and encourage them in this because there are going to be hardships. It's through many tribulations that you'll inherit the kingdom. If somebody tells you different, they're just lying. They're just lying. There are going to be hardships, brothers and sisters in Christ. There are. Just expect them. Just expect them. And stick with Jesus. He'll give you the grace to do it. He's actually given to the local church everything that they need. That's what these things are about. He's given them the apostolic deposit. He's given us the Bible. He's given us his word. He's given us his word so that when we face those hardships, uh, we can keep on going in the teaching of the Bible and remain true to the faith. Uh, when, we, when, we, when, when these hardships come, they won't knock us off course. And to help with that, secondly, he's also given pastoral oversight. They appointed elders in the plural, elders. The New Testament knows nothing of the solo pastorate. Right? They appointed pastoral oversight in the form of elders, plural, whose job it was to feed the flock of God by teaching the word. Right? The sheep belong to Jesus. They're the flock of God. They're not, they're, they're not the flock of the ministers. They're not the flock of the elders. The elders just have a responsibility. They're the flock of God. And what's the elders' responsibility? To teach the word so that the flock of God could be instructed in sound doctrine and protected from false, doct from false doctrine. And then finally, third, they committed them to the Lord. Uh, it's just wonderful. The Lord is Lord of his church. 
He's the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. The church belongs to Jesus, and he is well able to look after his people. He would keep them going with him, and he would keep them going into the world with the gospel. It's just wonderful for its simplicity, isn't it? What does Paul do as he goes back on this missionary journey with these local churches? He just says, here's the Bible. Here's some dudes who can teach it. Jesus is going to keep you going. That's what he does. That's enough. That's enough. That's pretty. I got to stop. I got to stop. Well, when Paul and Barnabas finally made it back to Antioch, they gather the whole church. And, and they tell the church all that God had done. Look at 27. Look at 27. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Uh, God had done it. Uh, the, the church was part of it. And, and so... Uh, um, the local church is incredibly significant uh, in God's strategy to get the gospel out to the world. See the bookends of the missionary journey? Holy Spirit says to the church, set these guys aside and send them out, right? Paul goes back to the church and says, look what God did. And I find it remarkable. Paul's like, look what God did. I got stoned. We got all these people like going at us, all this crazy stuff happened. And look what God did. Don't you think that's remarkable? He's like, I'm happy. I'm happy. I had to move all over the place. I had all these different responses. Look what God did. He got the gospel out. He got the gospel out. There are believers here, 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 and here, right? He's just rejoicing that God's getting the gospel out to the globe. Here's his strategy. Go to an urban center, preach the gospel, make disciples, right? The Lord converts people. Get, gather them together in the church, appoint elders, and leave them to the Lord. Consider the region evangelized and move on. That's what he does. It's wonderful. Why can he do that? Because God does it. Because God does it. And so they can rejoice together. God had cho told the church to set Paul and Barnabas apart. God had sent them. God had taken uh, them from place to place. God had given them the grace to proclaim the gospel. God had converted people. God had created churches. God had brought them back. God had opened the door for the Gentiles. It was all his grace. He gets all the glory. And it's a reminder that God does his work in and through his people. And Luke wants us to have confidence, therefore. Uh, we will face opposition, brothers and sisters. As the Lord gets the gospel out to the globe through us, we will face hardship and opposition. Count on it. What do we do in the face of opposition? We keep speaking. We keep speaking. We keep sp speaking the gospel. We may have to be agile. It's wonderful, isn't it? With certain opposition, what do Paul and Barnabas do? They stay there and they keep on preaching the gospel. With other hostility, what do they do? Whoop, let's go over here. But they keep preaching the gospel. They keep preaching the gospel. We may have to be agile, but we continue to, to declare the gospel, knowing that the gospel is more important than we are and trusting the Lord to bring in his people. Those who are appointed to eternal life will be saved. Don't doubt it. Have confidence, the Lord will do it. Well, we should be encouraged here that the gospel is always advancing. The gospel is unstoppable. Uh, this is a call to receive the gospel, to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus. His life, death, resurrection, respond. Believing in him and receiving from him forgiveness and justification. A clean slate, his righteousness right relationship with him forever and ever and ever. And as those who have received him, who do believe the gospel, declare it, brothers and sisters, declare it, get it out to the world. It's God's gospel. It's true. It's powerful. It's always advancing. Uh, and rejoice that the, uh, the gospel creates the local church. Uh, 
uh, the gospel sustains the local church and the gospel is the agenda of the local church. Can I just say that again? The gospel created us. And the gospel sustains us, so we need to camp out in it. And the gospel is our agenda. So just in case we're confused on the mission statement of Trinity of the Marketplace, just in case we don't know what we're about, let me tell you, the advance of the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for, uh, for your word. Uh, we're so thankful that you give us the heads up on, uh, on the opposition that comes as we proclaim the gospel. Lord, thanks for making us aware of it. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the great encouragement that the gospel advances always, that we're certain of it, because you, uh, you, uh, the risen and reigning Lord Jesus, continue to get it out to the globe. Lord, we're so thankful. We're so, so grateful that you would be pleased to use us in the process. Thanks that we get to participate. Do, do great gospel work in and through us, we pray. Lord, thanks, thanks for creating this local church by the proclamation of the gospel. Sustain us with the gospel, we pray. Uh, make us active uh, on board with your agenda to get the gospel out. And uh, Lord, we pray that in the process, many other churches would be created by the gospel uh, as it's proclaimed from here around the world. Uh, Lord, we, uh, uh, we praise you that you do all of this. Uh, we trust you to do it. We give you all the praise and the glory and the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.
Isn't it just comforting to know that no one, no event, no situation, no enemy, nothing can keep our king from his intended purposes for his kingdom and the spread of the message of his gospel. What a comforting thing. So let's go together before his throne in reverent awe, but confident in what our King has done for us. Heavenly Father, your word gives us so much encouragement today. You laugh when the nations rage against you. Be they evil, conniving magicians or jealous people who poison the local environment. Not content with just their own destruction, but intent on cursing and destroying everyone else with them. Not even unruly mobs intent on killing your servants. The message of the gospel is just too important. And the world must hear it. Father, we are so grateful that the spread of the gospel and the growth of your church does not depend on us. We would just mess it all up. And yet, you call us to join in the work. And you give us specific tasks to do that are a part of what you're already doing and for which you grant us the grace and the power to do it. Thank you for that kindness to us and the confidence that we can't screw things up so badly that you can't achieve your purposes. Oh, Lord God, encourage us, your people, to continue in the faith. Strengthen us to believe and live into your promises for us and to marvel at what you've already done for us in King Jesus. Father, trials and tribulations can just knock the wind out of us and throw us to the ground so hard that we don't think we can even lift up our heads. And when the enemy goes after our children, it's easy to panic and despair. But you are greater by far than the sum of all of our fears. Even as you do, you do not sugarcoat the fact that we must all enter the, your kingdom through many tribulations. Please strengthen our hands so that we might grab on to you with everything we are and give us a clear-sighted view of Jesus so that his glory thrills us and everything else pales in comparison. When the waves seem like mountains and the wind howls in fierce rage against us, please, Please keep us fixed on Jesus, our King, our Rescuer, and the Lover of our souls. Father, we pray for the people of Trinity. We are all a smelly, hot mess. But you are sovereign in everything, and you are good. We cry out to you for families and individuals who are facing hard trials and tribulations, for brothers and sisters who have no good solution in front of them and can only put their hope and trust in you. We do not pray for what we want or what they want, but we ask for what is best best for them, for what will produce glory and praise that your name would be honored and revered. We pray for a deliverance in power that only you can provide so that no one may boast 
or be proud. But you are proved just and righteous, full of grace and mercy, and that your love for your people is clearly on display for all to see. We take a moment now to silently lift up to you those who you have placed on our heart. Heavenly Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine and especially for your people, your church there. Father, strengthen, purify, cleanse, and be glorified in them. We pray for our missionaries. Show us how to pray effectively for them. Strengthen and encourage them during those times when it just feels like Breathing is too hard to do. Grant them great success in everything they put their hands to do. Father, provide for their needs and give them great joy and fellowship with fellow believers. We pray for the persecuted church around the world. Those who are losing everything, including their lives for the sake of the name of Jesus. Grant them boldness and great joy in you, we pray. We long for that day when your son will rule on his throne here and set everything right. We don't want to wait, but grant us the patience and endurance that we will need and keep us to the very end for yourself, a people for your very own. Amen. Now is the time where we give to the ongoing work of the gospel. We're gonna, uh, let's stand and sing. While we uh, while we pass those bags, um, uh, and and uh, here's the encouragement for us today. I think uh, the church at Antioch were um, were happy to give sacrificially for the sake of the gospel. So um, with cheerful and uh, grateful hearts, let's give sacrificially to the ongoing work of the gospel, and let's sing together. Take my life and let it be. Hey! 
take up a collection this way because it's uh, part of our worship. And uh, so let me pray as we worship the Lord together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks that we uh, get to worship you by walking wholeheartedly in the way of your word in all of life. We give you praise and thanks that you have granted to us grace to worship you and giving away to the work of the gospel. And Lord, we not only give this money away, to the work of the gospel, but as we just sang, we give ourselves away to the work of the gospel. And so use us, Lord, use this money to get the good news about Jesus out to the globe. Uh, Thank you that it's your work and that you get it done, that you'll bring your people in. We uh, have every confidence in you, and we're just so glad to be part of it. And we pray uh, that you would give us grace to be part of it in such a way Uh, that you get all the glory and we get all the joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stay standing. Uh, There uh, there are announcements. Cindy has served as well, sending them out uh, to our inboxes. You can take a picture of them if you need them. Uh, I'm going to commend them to you and I'm going to move us on. Um, So lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. All glory and honor, thanks and praise be yours now and always, Lord. Holy Father, mighty creator, ever-living God. We give you hearty thanks, Lord. We give you hearty thanks and praise for your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for our sins and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. We pray that we who receive these, your gifts of bread and wine, according to our Savior Jesus Christ's word, in remembrance of his death, may be partakers of his body and blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink ye all of this. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so humbly and gratefully, we pray together. We dare not come to your table, merciful Lord, depending on our own goodness. In your grace alone we trust. For we are unworthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. Gracious Father, grant that we who now receive these gifts of bread and wine, according to our Savior's word, may share in his body and blood that we may always live in him and he in us. Oh, man, all who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who are in love and charity with their neighbor, who intend to live the new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways by his moment-by-moment grace are very, very welcome to his table. Uh, We'll receive the Lord's Supper today by coming up to the front. There'll be two baskets at the front. Uh, pick out the elements and take them back to your seat, and then we'll all partake together. Let's sing, Jesus, thank you. Hold on. Hold on. 
cross I cannot with the Lord Almighty. It's glorious, isn't it? Why? Because the gospel is true. So, uh, so let's dig into that bread and uh, take it out and take and uh, eat this in remembrance that Jesus died on the cross for you. He's paid the price in full. He's given you his righteousness. He's welcomed you to his table. You're going to be with him forever and ever and ever. If that doesn't make your heart happy, nothing will. So take this with a happy, happy heart. Let's open the cup. And together, let's drink this 
uh, remembering that Jesus shed his most precious blood for us and that we belong to him. It's certain and it's sure and it's forever. He's the king. Be thankful. And let's pray together the prayer on the screens. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together by faith. On faith we see the hand of God. In the light of creation's grand design, in the lives of those who prove his faithful day, he walk by faith and not by sight. Our faith, our fathers grow the earth, with the power of his prophecy. Stand as children of the Father. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls to war. Till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, the prophets saw the dream. With the long for the sight of the wood. Chains of sin and death, and Christ triumphant from the grave. I think the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner. mountain shall be and the power of the gospel shall prevail we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our souls will And let's dismiss one another with a benediction from 1 Chronicles 16. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be feared above all gods. Amen. We will stand as children of the promise. We will face our